I'm going to start with the premise that fundraising is really fucking hard. Uh, we've all heard stories, the TechCrunch article, the friend of a friend of a friend who met a person who went for a drink, you know, when humans were still allowed to gather and the world wasn't on lockdown. And suddenly they walked out with a term sheet. Those stories are the anomalous ones. They're not really representative of what fundraising means. I'll share with you that my first startup, which was 2007 into 2008, for those of you who remember, not the best time in world finance, and that trickled down into startup land. My first startup required 120 pitches, 18 months of my life. I didn't take a paycheck before we got first offer. Fundraising's hard. Uh, what I didn't know then that I very, very much know now and that uh, Leslie and I and our partners all espouse regularly is that fundraising is a skill no different than marketing, than sales, than hiring, the other fundamental components of how to build a company. Uh, it's a skill that is unique to startup life and nonprofits, but it's a skill nonetheless. And if I line up the startups and the founders who know how to do it well versus those who don't, there is a massive advantage to the former. Uh, my name is Jonathan Lonehart. Um, as Alistair, in a very lovely way, shared my brief background. Um, if I go back in time, I started my life at Big Co. I ran a billion dollar division for a large public company. I then took over a turnaround that was a $150 million business, about a few thousand employees. I then jumped in not knowing what I was doing into a first startup with two other co-founders, a prototype with smoke coming out of its sides and $100,000 of seed funding and built my first company, which did fine. We raised a couple of rounds of venture and over four years created enough value to have someone lean in and buy us. I then masochistically just jumped right back into another startup, uh, this time uh, a seed stage company of about 30 employees and a couple of hundred thousand dollars of annual revenue and grew it to its first 20 million in revenue. I left that business in 2014 uh, with the early ideas of what became Enjoy the Work. Uh, and that is the separation, this identification that there is this difference between the magic a founder comes up with that the world needs and then building a company around that magic. And then while the magic, the innovation is the unique domain of crazy founders, Company building is always the same. That can walk into any well-run early stage company and I will see the same things. And that it was always crazy to me that startups were the one profession where we just expect founders to learn on the job. Imagine if we did that with pilots or with <laughs> surgeons, but we don't. But with founders, no, good luck. That seemed crazy to me. And so over the last seven years, myself, and a group of us that are all superheroes, that are all veteran founder folks, have gathered together and now work with a large population of founders. And I'm thrilled to be joined by one of my partners, uh, Leslie Fine. Thanks. Um, I won't uh, repeat all of the somewhat embarrassing, mostly facts that Alistair <laughs> shared. Um, I, I will share just. Piling on to what Jonathan just said, uh, in our partnership, we have folks who've done tons of fundraising, have built a ton of products, have been ex-CFOs. We all kind of come to this from a different place, um, but really all focused on the idea that we have a hero myth. Uh, in Silicon Valley and in the metaphoric Silicon Valley, that just because you had a great idea and knew how to build it and get it out into the world means you know how to tell a story, To hire well, to create accountability, to do a strategic partnership. Uh, we don't believe that's true. Uh, we believe it is an art and a craft that can be taught. So uh, just as a quick level set on what we look like, we're eight partners about to grow to nine. Uh, we uh, currently support over 50 startups that are roughly 40% seed stage, 40% series A and B, and 20% growth stage, big grown up companies. Uh, in the last couple of years alone, we've done more than 150 fundraises from tiny rounds uh, that were for profitable companies ascending, but they didn't need a lot of capital, like our colleague Sophia from Enjoy HQ, who many of you have just met, to giant growth rounds, $150 million Series D, and everything in between, inside rounds, recapitalizations, high intensity, 
Series A's. Uh, put all that money together, it's about $800 million in capital. Here's a sampling uh, of, of our companies. Uh, what I'm proud to say is over the last few years, uh, we've, we've ha had the opportunity to participate in what has been the continued acceleration and growth of the Canadian ecosystem. And so about a dozen of these companies uh, are, are companies located in Vancouver, Toronto, Montreal, et cetera. So Jonathan and I have a lot of things in common. One of them is that my uh, first real fundraise was also in 2008 and it was brutal. Uh, we got our first term sheet the day that Lehman Brothers collapsed. Um, most of you on this might be too young to remember that, but in 2008, the market fell 800 points in a day. Uh, we were on the last, uh, the last helicopter out of Saigon. And we made a ton of mistakes getting there. Um, my next business in 2012, totally different business, different stage, uh, same pain, dead ends, long nose, wasted effort. Uh, and, and it got me thinking, is there a pattern to why a raise goes well or poorly? Um, and, and there are three basic reasons things might go well or poorly. Uh, first is that you don't have the traction for your stage. You're, you're out over your skis, you're raising an A and you've just put out the initial product, for example. Uh, the second is that you have the wrong type of investor. And we'll talk more in a minute about um, sort of founder investor match and how to think about that. Uh, and the third, and, and this is what, what John and I spend our days doing, is thinking about, you just don't know how. Uh, it's a discipline like any other, and, and it can be learned. So uh, I mentioned appropriate traction. <clears throat> and I think this is, this is a place where people get confused pretty often. So we'll walk through each. Um, in seed stage, in short, you're still building the product. It means from the investor point of view, uh, your business is real. There's evidence, it's not just you or your friends, or your family saying it works. So you actually have first users, ideally who are partying with money or something similar to, to use it, uh, that love the product, that would kick and scream if you took it away. Um, what an investor is looking for at this stage is a little bit sector dependent, but there's some evidence that there's a thing to follow here, that if we put on money in money and we tune the machine, we'll be able to actually create something profitable. So next stage. Why, why won't my slides go? There we go. Uh, your business is repeatable. Uh, you're now building the company. And I think uh, people confuse repeatable and scalable all the time. Repeatable just means that you know how to predictably attract a customer, win that customer, deploy to them, and thrill them. Uh, the machine is predictable. You understand your numbers to some way. It is not optimized. It is not tuned. Uh, but it's a relatable, reliable flywheel. Uh, and that's when Series A investors will start to take you seriously. Series B and beyond, your business is scalable. What scalable means is the only thing that's holding you back from growing this thing like a weed is money. Give me money, everything else works. I know how to be a giant. Uh, I don't have a ceiling anymore. Give me a dollar and I'll predictably turn it into a dollar three coming out the bottom, but every single time. So investor match. Um, I know that when I raised my first round, I was like, well, they're a VC and they like me, therefore they will write me a check. Um, it's not actually how it works. And I, I think all of us have gotten uh, some kind of phishing email that said, hey, you know, I noticed your business and I'm so-and-so and I live, in, I work at this company and I'd love to chat. Um, those are not actually investors. Those are SDRs that work for the fund. They've built a list, they're poking people, they're just trying to get top of the funnel, just like you are in your business. Uh, and they're, they're gonna shoot with a, a, a really like scattering. Um, you're just as likely to get pinged by someone at a, a PE firm that writes $50 million checks while you're still at seed stage. And they're gonna get you all excited and you're gonna lose half a day like, oh my God, this PE firm pinged me and I don't know how to reply. And you're gonna spend all this time crafting the thing. They have no fucking interest in you. They're just trying to figure out the market a little bit. What's important to realize um, is to have empathy for the fact that the VC has a, uh, has a boss too. They've raised their monies from LPs and to the LPs, they've, they've sold a vision. Uh, we're gonna invest in these kinds of companies, in these kinds of industries with these kinds of check size. And that's their job. They're not gonna break it. They're gonna stick to that. So no matter how much they like what you're doing, if they have a fund where the thesis is to write five to $10 million checks 
into energy companies and you're an early stage mobile gaming platform, it's a waste of your time. There's, they're never, they might chat with you because it's interesting and it's fun to learn stuff, but they're never writing the check. Um, so that brings us to the second point. Um, besides check size, it's sector fit. Um, we have a, a partner, a fund we partner with called Reach Capital. They're lovely, they're brilliant, and all they do is invest in K-12 ed tech. It doesn't matter who I might want to introduce them to in our portfolio. If it's not K-12 ed tech, they're not doing it. And by the way, I'm not making the intro. No matter how many times we've hung out, no matter how much I love your business, it is a waste of my introduction calories to make that introduction for you. So this, the precision here matters a lot. The third thing you need to realize is just like you, uh, that fund has an out of cash date, right? They know exactly when they're going to use up the pool that we're they're, they're working from and they're working backwards. Um, however, we have this awkward thing. We think of out of cash as equaling bankrupt. And so we don't talk about it. It's kind of taboo culturally. It is not. Ask your VC in the most polite way you can. What's the life cycle of your fund? Uh, yeah. I also like the way of asking, hey, are you fucking broke? Either one works. <laughs> Just, you know, leave the check on the table for a minute and see how quickly they grab it. And then you'll know what's left in their fund. Or or you could just fucking ask them. Um, what's the life cycle? Uh, what do you have to invest right now? Do you lead with those investments? It's a huge difference. I mean, we, we did a fundraise um, in Q4. I don't know, we probably had, I'm, I'm not even exaggerating, 50 funds that were like, as soon as you get a lead, I would like to write a check. And it took forever to find that lead. And we, you know, I, we finally got through the entrepreneur, stop taking meetings where they won't leave rounds. Uh, and we only focused on leads. Her funnel narrowed dramatically, but we got a lead. And I'd say probably about 30 of the 50 wound up actually following on. Um, so definitely inquire about the funding status of the, the fund you're in. So this brings us to the last failure mode. Um, the last reason, reason we fail is we don't know how to raise. Uh, it starts with two really important things. And, and if you take nothing away from our conversation this morning other than this, remember this. Investors only get fired for the deals they actually do. Um, there are 1,500 V-series firms, probably more than that now, Jonathan. Um, yes. <laughs> yes. They are, pro they are proliferating. Yeah. It's like you There's put water on them after midnight. <laughs> uh, if you ever go to one of these networking events back when we had networking events and they're filled with VCs, you put a few drinks and then the same stories show up. I could have invested in fill in the blank. I could have been early at Uber. I was the first person to hear the pitch of Airbnb. I, I almost was the person who wrote Sergey the first check. Everybody has a story. Um, the everybody fish that has. got away. Yeah. I, the difference is these people still have jobs. They didn't get fired because they let the fish get away. They lost billions of dollars for their portfolios and yet they're fine. Now go to that same bar and find the poor motherfucker who invested in Theranos. He doesn't talk about it because mm -hmm. he got screwed on it. So the, the, the risk profile of a VC is they're going to be looking not to find the Airbnb so much as to avoid the Theranos. Um, they only are gonna get fired when they fuck up, not when they pass. They pass on almost every deal they do. So the other truth, and we're gonna spend the majority of our time on this today, uh, is all investors from the teeniest, tiniest seed stage company up to Warburg Pincus, eventually between hello and here's the money in your bank account, are gonna ask the same questions. We say there are 28 of them, maybe they're 25, maybe they're 30, but they have a set of questions they will ask. And um, most of you were probably excellent students at one point in your life. If you approach fundraising like a standardized test where they publish the fucking questions beforehand and you write down your answers and you think about them and you practice them and you go through, there is no excuse to show up to a financing round and be surprised or shocked or defensive or on your back foot or um ahhing and having to send an answer afterwards. And now you look bad and maybe like you're hiding something. There is no reason. Uh, it's utterly predictable. You can study them in advance. 
Okay, we made a lot of references to the fact this is a long dance and all of this. Uh, let's walk through what the dance actually looks like. There is this delicacy that we want to make sure to get across. And that is, yes, you're going to know all, if you want to, if you want to do the homework, you're going to know all the test questions in advance and you can prep for them all. That doesn't mean being disingenuous. That doesn't mean representing yourself in a way that's inauthentic. If you're just trying to do a transaction with someone, like a flea market, and you're just trying to buy something once and you're never going to see the seller ever again, you can make up whatever fucking story you want of like, oh, this relative isn't feeling well and my arm hurts and this is why I should only pay $4 for the thing. You're never gonna see each other again. This is not a relationship, it's a transaction. But a fundraise is actually the beginning of a relationship. The average startup that has success is an eight to 13 year journey. The beginning of a fundraise is the beginning of dating towards an engagement that's going to last a decade of your life. So we want you to think of the fundraise journey in a similar funnel, in a similar cadence as you would if you started dating somebody. There's a first date where you get to know each other and you ask some questions, but you don't immediately jump in and say, so what should we name our future children? <laughs> And the only goal of that first date is, can we get to a second date? Did we enjoy this enough where I'm willing to give you another slice of my life and you're willing to do the same with me? You get to a second date. If you get past the second date, you're starting to flirt with the idea of maybe regularly dating this person and really getting to know them. If that goes well and this is a little old fashioned, maybe you meet the people that this potential romantic relationship of yours cares about their siblings, their parents, their friends, and they're going to evaluate the shit out of you and then whisper things. If that goes incredibly well, maybe you move in and oh my God, maybe you get engaged. I understand that some of this might be a little bit dated, sorry for the pun, but the notion still stands that you're going to get to know this person over time. And if we now superimpose across this funnel, how investors are going to evaluate you, it's the same. You're <laughs> going to have a first meeting. It's going to be 30 to 45 minutes long. You are going to give your pitch deck as if you're sitting at a bar having cocktails. If the meeting goes well, there's only one outcome. There's a second date, a second meeting. In venture vernacular, what will happen is that investor who met with you the first time will say something like, I'd love to meet again. And I wanna pull in this person or this person or this person to also have them meet you. The second date looks exactly like the first. It's just a little longer and there's someone else there which I get is a little bit of a diversion unless you happen to be poly from the normal dating metaphor, but still you're going from first to second. If that goes well, now you're gonna start dating, AKA business diligence. Here's what this really means. In first date, you're gonna show a pitch deck. In second date, they're gonna ask you a lot of questions. You're going to have to navigate those questions. If it goes well, business diligence. That is a different way of saying, I now want evidence to support the answers that you gave during the first and second date. If that goes well, they're going to start to believe you and you're going to have to meet their colleagues who ultimately make a decision. If that goes well, if the partner meeting goes well, they're gonna present terms to you. Uh, those terms are like an engagement contract it's like the marriage contract. It's going to represent, we're going to buy this percentage of your company uh, in return for this amount of money at this valuation. So the reason we stress this so much is be authentic, be honest, get to know them, let them get to know you. That doesn't mean don't be optimistic, don't be passionate, don't be excited, show them your best self but it's not a transaction at the flea market where you can get away with a story. Nope, this is instead the beginning of a 10 year dance.
The fundraise itself, it rests on three pillars. We tend to take about a month with our companies to fully prep for these. It's like prepping for the bar exam or the MCATs. You're preparing for a major test in your life. The three pillars of the pitch itself, the materials that you'll need to support all the things you're about to say about your business, and then the investor list. We're gonna go through each of these in a bunch of detail. But if we follow through on that same playful metaphor, you're preparing for a first date. So again, um, think about what you would do if you're going out on a date you're pretty excited about. You get yourself in a good mood. One of the playful things that I used to get a bit of made fun of for was in my last company, when you're doing the same pitch, you're giving the same story over and over again. Uh, and you have to be excited each time. Why do you have to be excited? Because an investor is about to say, hey, I, I, I might give you money and be in a room with you for 10 years. If you're not excited about your company, there's no way I'm going to be excited about your company. So each time you do this, you have to get a little bit juiced up. So get yourself in the best mood. I used to go out in the balcony outside of our office, put on headphones, dance, do push-ups, jump around by myself. And so my company, which had windows all along this balcony at the time, my coworkers all knew when we were fundraising because they could just look out the window and say, oh, Jonathan's dancing by himself like a crazy person again. Second, investors want to invest in masters, in market masters. They, have, they, they look for what they call founder market fit, which means you deeply, deeply know your domain. And they really want to invest in folks that energetically embody that. We call it arrogantly likable. I know my world better than you do. I know my business better than you do. I know my market better than you do. And I'm still smiling and I'm excited to listen to you. When you go into this first date, just like you would on a real date, figure out what you wanna learn, the kind of questions you might wanna ask. And I'd like you to not discount yourself and remember that coming into this meeting, it's the start of a relationship and they're as lucky to meet you as you are to meet them. Okay, I'm gonna wrap up the, um, uh, the structure for this first date really quickly. Because the goal of the first day is just to get to a second one. I want you to start that date. It's a little bit different from this, is a bit of a diversion <laughs> from an actual romantic experience where I think if you sat <laughs> down and gave a flowery monologue, it might be a little bit strange. Um, but you're gonna open with a compelling story. We're in 20 or 30 seconds. You're gonna say, here's why you're here. Enjoy the work, believes there's a separation between the magic a founder does and building a company. We're here to teach the building a company how to actually do that skill. Roughly 20 slides in 20 minutes. I'm not gonna show you what those slides are. Leslie and I are not gonna bore you with that. If you Google search great seed decks, great series A decks, you will be inundated with great examples. And lastly, please be yourself and ask questions. Don't put on a mask, don't present, just speak to them, let them get to know who you really are. So I know Jonathan said we wouldn't show a deck, but I will give you a couple of our, our key tips for, for when you're creating yours. Um, the first and probably the one that's most important to me, one message on one slide. And for God's sake, make the headline compelling because you know the thousands and thousands of pitch decks that get sent around, most people are gonna flip through and look at the headlines. So instead of having a slide that says financials, have it say, 180% Kager over the last 12 months or something like that that tells the person what the message is that you're trying to get across. Um, I know for the sake of efficiency, we, we've all been told only have 15 slides and it's just a rule of thumb. Uh, we're just trying to get to brevity in that first deck and that, that first and second date. Um, but don't be such a slave to that arbitrary rule that you wind up jamming information in. Um, do what you can to utterly, clearly convey what your business is about. Give them information shortcuts. They're consuming a lot of information. As of any story, have some empathy for your reader. Um, particularly critical uh, for consumer businesses or high on UX or mobile apps, be ready to demo. Uh, and when you do that, 
don't do it in production or at least don't feel like you have to. Um, everything you show has to be beautiful and it has to work. Uh, an investor spends, you know, maybe a minute before he decides that he's not interested in this at all. And, and we want to make sure that along the path to that check, there's nothing that gets them scared that sends them running away. This might be a Theranos. So if you're going to show something, make sure it works. It can be a digital twin of production that's kept someplace else so nobody can mess it up when they're pushing a release. Whatever it is, just keep it really safe to build the fantasy investor's mind of what you could be doing. Um, to that, build in big reveals. This is the classic Steve Jobs move. It's the one more thing. Uh, if you have some crazy, amazing story, uh, bury it somewhere. You know, we, we've said that everyone's going to ask the same questions. So that makes it sound like everything's predictable. But if you put, you know, a, a little Easter egg in your deck, you know, on the 24th slide, there's something about my IP. And I happen to mention that I hold 14 patents in the space. Now the investor feels like they have an unfair advantage. Oh, I learned a thing about this person that makes this special, that makes me have a, have a inside track on this deal. Um, number four, show some passion. I know based on Jonathan's math, you're going to do a hundred pitches. And on that hundred and first, you're going to be completely bored of what you're doing. Um, got to find that charisma. If you don't come across excited about your business, there's no way they will be. Um, and for some people, they're just not excited people. So I don't want you to not come across authentically you, but try to come across as that, that, that passionate version of you. Direct answers to direct questions. So there's there's two kinds of people. Um, one, I say, hey, do you have any revenue? And, and that CEO says, no, not yet. We're pre-revenue. Uh, Entrepreneur 2 says, well, we're launching on Thursday. We're almost across the line. We have two more partnerships. An engineer is working on the thing. We have our pipeline. So give me a month and we might have some revenue. And I know a lot of you are going to want to tell that story. When it comes to investors, be that first entrepreneur. They're meeting, as I've said, thousands of you. They have no patience. Uh, so if somebody asks you a direct question, be really straightforward. Otherwise, you're just annoying and you're defensive. Yeah, let's um, stress this. So if you're in a major market, if, if you're in uh, one of the hotter startup markets in the world, investors are literally meeting two to 3,000 entrepreneurs a year, and they're making 10 investments or 12 investments. They have no patience. If your communication style is not direct and efficient, they're tuning you out. Yeah. Uh, and again, it's, it's all de-risking. Everything is about, this is compelling. It's inevitable in the world. This guy's not going to land me in the Wall Street Journal for the wrong reasons along the way. Um, so just keep coming back to de-risking the deal. And, and to that, um, co-founder dynamics are, are so important here. Uh, we all have relationships in our, in our office where we playfully step in each other or, for example, start talking over the other person's slide. That never happens to me. Um, but you, you've got a chemistry that works for you. Uh, and that's great. Don't do it in front of an investor. Investors are hyper-conscious of any kind of energy that feels like bad chemistry. Uh, more companies die of suicide than of homicide. So they're looking for the way that you guys are going to kill each other. And if they feel like, ooh, there's a tension there, ooh, I'm not, not sure they're actually supporting each other, they're going to run the, away from you immediately. Um, lastly especially for seed stage. If you're series D, this is not okay. But at seed and even at A, um, it is okay and even powerful and, and vulnerable and relationship building to say, I don't know. Someone may ask you, you know, what does it cost you for a lead today? And if you don't know, say, I don't know. We're still experimenting. It's one of the things I'm hoping to unlock in this next round of funding. With, with, in the context of I don't know, I, I, I also want to emphasize you can't hide stuff. All investors ask the same questions. There's no, there are no questions they're not going to ask. So if you find yourself as an entrepreneur trying to pull back or hide or in some way obscure the parts of your business that you're not proud of, all you're doing is hurting a relationship. So for example, going back to our dating metaphor, you've gone on six dates with someone. It feels amazing. 
And then you finally admit that you have a kid from a prior marriage. You're done. It's over. And not because you have a child from a prior marriage, but because you've now probably spent 10 to 15 hours with someone and chose to not share it. Again, you might not share it in the first date. That's reasonable. But by date six, in the same way here, all questions are going to get asked. So be upfront. If you have bad news about your business, we want that in the materials. We want that in the pitch deck. Because since all questions are gonna get asked, we never want our founders ever defensive. So if you have some stuff that you're not as proud of, be upfront about it. If you have something that's a little hidden, it's an Easter egg as Leslie described, we might build in some reveals. Okay, so what are these materials that we keep referring to? This is the dance I want you to remember. In that first date, first dates are easy. And you're gonna just do your pitch deck and you're gonna receive a handful of softball questions, generally speaking. If there's enough interest, the only thing the investor is evaluating in that first date is, do I wanna spend more time with you? Do I want a second date? Do I want a second meeting? If they spend time with you in that second meeting, now you're going to have to objection handle. They're going to ask you hard questions. If you get past that, then they want evidence to support your answers to those questions. And that's what your materials represent. A financial model that's forward looking and easily manipulatable. The accuracy of the model does not matter. You're all gonna be wrong. You're gonna be wrong by a lot. But did you have good critical thinking in it? That's what does matter. The pitch deck itself, you need something that can be shared since whoever you're working with on the venture side is going to socialize your materials with their colleagues. You wanna make it easy for them. A cap table, which is just a fancy phrase for who owns the company today. Potentially be ready with a demo as Leslie described earlier. Make sure it absolutely works every time. Uh, product data, engagement data. How do you know customers are using your thing? Particularly critical if you're a consumer business. And then what we call the 28 questions. Some of this you will hand over kind of asynchronously in writing, and most of it you're going to have to be ready on the fly to answer when the questions come. So let's start diving through. Uh, we're going to go through these really rapidly, really fast. For those of you are curious and want to dig in deeper, we're going to be in office hours. We're happy to tackle these, as well as a variety of other one-off questions that you might have, like, do you share the information in docs end or how is an inside round different than an outside round? There are a million variations to these, but these are the 28 generic questions all investors ask. First one, what problem are you attempting to solve? If, you're, if your answer to this question doesn't make sense to someone who's utterly non-technical, then you don't have a good answer to this question yet. This question is to be simple and clear. What is your solution to that problem? Same idea. If this answer doesn't work for someone non-technical in your life, then you haven't nailed the answer yet. What makes your team qualified for this opportunity? This is founder market fit. What about your background or your leadership team's background perfectly aligned to what you're trying to accomplish in the world so that you can demonstrate mastery? Who are the co-founders? How do you know each other and how long have you worked together? This is all a jumbled way of saying, do the two or three or four of you know each other well enough to get through hard times? If you just met three weeks ago at a bar, Investors are not investing no matter how smart and capable you are. If you've been <laughs> together for 11 years, now they believe you've been through some stuff. What skills are missing from the team? What investors want to hear is your technology works and maybe you need some go-to-market help. They love that problem because it's a solved problem. Next, what evidence or what proof do you have that your solution works? Um, this is a traction question. The more evidence you have that it's not just you sitting alone in front of your computer saying it works, the better. You're gonna want a story to this and the stories that work really well for proof are a little bit of math and a little bit of a case study. All right, uh, we're gonna keep rapid firing through these. So the first here is what market do you sell to? Who's your customer? The point here is that the more specific you are, the better. Don't name a category. I wanna know that you know who to sell to at the White Hot Center. So if you're B2B, you wanna get the title in the ARG. We sell directors of finance and SMB hardware companies. I laid out the size of the company, whether I'm, I'm you know, hunting elephants or whales, I've talked about the part of the business they're in, and I've talked about the level they are in the company. 
Uh, again, if you don't know yet, you can talk about the fact that you don't know, but the more that you can say, this is who my ideal customer profile or ICP is, the better. How do you reach that customer? Again, it is fine if this is theoretical. Whatever your theory about tofu is, top of the funnel, not the food, uh, it should align with everything else in your model. And, and if you take nothing else away, and I know I've said that before, but if you take a second thing away today, <laughs> consistency. Everything has to align up. So if you have a story about top of funnel, it should align to your financial model. It should align to your demand gen. It should align to your product marketing. Consistency across this is key to a coherent story. What are the alternatives that your customer uh, will use? This is a question really about pain. Um, investors have a bias, and, and I think it's an accurate bias, that if you're solving a real pain, they're already solving it today. Uh, it may be manual, it may suck, they may hate it, it may be 47 Excel spreadsheets and then they print it out and they give it to their dog, but they are solving it somehow. And you need to understand uh, how, what that solution is and why it's terrible. If the problem feels at all foreign to the investor, this story will help them connect to it. Well, they first have to do this and have to do this. It will humanize the problem in the world that you're trying to solve. Uh, how do you sustainably generate leads and what are your KPIs? Again, it's okay if you don't have answers and instead say, you know, to date, our deal's been founder generated. And one of the primary milestones of this round is to identify a repeatable go-to-market model. Um, this is another place where too much storytelling instead of metrics will hurt credibility. If you have metrics, by all means, use numbers at all times. But if you don't, just own it. Uh, again, back to simplicity. How do you price your solution? How do you earn money? Keep it super simple. They are just, on this first date especially, trying to categorize you. We sell per seat licenses and we take a transaction fee on top. Ah. Now I know what kind of metrics I need to use and what good looks like because you're a SaaS plus transactions business. I understand that is different than I'm selling a piece of hardware or whatever it is. Keep it that simple. Uh, and again, just make sure it matches the model. Investors are pattern recognition machines. They're really good at it. They have a set of things that they look for each and every time. And the more easily uh, you can lean into one of their patterns. Uh, the better that first date's going to go because they have an archetype in mind. Like, oh, I got it. You come from the industry. That makes sense. Oh, you're B2B SaaS. Okay, I understand. You're pre-seed or you're seed or you're A. Okay, I understand. The moment they get the pattern, the category you're in, it will immediately shift their mind to interpreting your answers as, does that fit? Are you ahead of schedule or are you behind schedule? It's extremely useful. So even as you open a conversation, and, and it's likely implicit within the way you're introduced to the investor, so it probably doesn't wait to the first date. It's on your dating profile, as you will, or the friend who introduces the two of you. They should already have some context, and you should have some context about them. And humans only learn through one of two ways. We either learn through something being emotionally impactful or we learn through repetition. There are only two ways we learn. So uh, you might have to repeat a few times, your pre-seed, your seed, your A, you're raising 2 million, especially as you go through these questions and they ask you a question like, what is your churn today? What are your primary causes? And how is it trended over time? That's only a relevant question for companies that are, are of a certain stage and above. That said, what I want to impress upon you again and again and again is be authentic in your answer to this question. If you've lost some customers, tell them. They're going to find out because, again, any answers you give, they're going to ask for evidence of those answers at a later stage. So don't be embarrassed about it. If we actually had some churn, we might even put it in the deck so that we don't even get the question because it's not a great question to have to answer. But what I want you to impress upon the investor with this answer is what you've learned from it. How do you measure customer engagement? You have to know, are customers using your thing or not? And does it align to the value you're trying to create? All of you have heard this notion of product market fit. You've probably heard lots of different definitions. We have our own big surprise. There are three parts to product market fit for us. One, 
Do you know what you're selling and to who? Two, does the thing you're selling work? Does it work? And three, would customers scream if you took it away? To know if your thing works, you have to know if people are using it. <laughs> That's what an investor means by measuring customer engagement. Next, what are resources required to deploy a new customer expenses, time, change management, et cetera? Um, we have a, this is a, the B2B version of our 28 questions. We also have a B2C version. We are happy to share this with anyone who asks. If you want to send us a note, we're really easy to find after the fact or come to our office hours. Um, the harder it is to get a customer up and running, the slower you will grow. And that's the concern or question investors have. If it's messy today, that's okay, especially if you're early stage. If really your deployment process or user adoption process is held together with bubble gum and duct tape, fine. But point them to the future as well. We can automate this and deploy this and connect this and suddenly it's much, much easier. Those questions will lead into how much does it cost you to get a user or get a customer? And what cash do you get out of that relationship? The fancy phrase you'll hear is per unit economics of your business. On an anatomical level, on a customer level, what is cash in, what is cash out? Not gap revenue, by the way. We're not talking about accounting math here, just pure cash, because that's all investors are concerned about in the beginning of your company journey. How much do you have to burn to get the kind of customer you want? And how much do you get in return for that relationship? So the next question they're gonna ask you, a version of, is cool, well, that's the first thing you're gonna do. What are you gonna do in the future? And this is where you can paint a narrative. And you don't have, you see how I mix metaphors there? You don't actually have to have <laughs> hard evidence of any of that, but you do have to have a story on the horizon. And it's a, probably a fun one. It's one most, invest, most entrepreneurs enjoy playing in. Yeah, I, I just wanna reiterate something you just said there, which is, if we're talking about the present day, be credible and precise and as numerical as you can. That doesn't mean that you're not allowed to fantasize. You're not allowed mm. to talk about what the business is going to look like. Nobody wants to invest in what your business looks like today, except for the fact that your business today is evidence that eventually you will be that business later. So they wanna know, what is that gonna look like? If every coin flip comes up heads, where are we together in five years? So when, when Jonathan and I talk about like, be precise, make sure it all lines up, it doesn't mean just be boring, right? Like know your numbers today, be clear on your math today, but definitely dream and bring them along on it. Big difference. All right, uh, similar to some of the product questions and this fantasizing, additional customer segments. Where else could you go? Uh, you know, Facebook started as a dating site for one school, slightly creepy dating site, uh, very creepy. Uh, PayPal just let buy, people buy stuff on eBay. I haven't bought anything on eBay in, well, ever since this Logitech camera I'm looking at because it was the only way to get one a year ago. Uh, generally, I don't use that, but I use PayPal all the time. Um, Amazon was a bookstore. Where is that tiny white hot center uh, of what you're doing today? And then where could we go? Uh, again, this is a place to start in the, the very precise uh, present and then fantasize into the future. Who are the competitors in the space and how are you sustainably different? Um, this is a question about defensibility. Again, not necessarily today, but where are you going to go? If you start winning, are you playing in somebody else's sandbox? Who's going to come for you? What is the narrative of the moat that you'll have at that point? Uh, often, you know, they're, they're sort of the two most common moats in B2B are either network effects or, or data ownership. Um, so make sure that you have a story of if we are successful, if we get to that place where all the coins came up head, what is our unfair advantage going to be such that we can't be caught? Next one is not a trick question. Um, they want to know how much capital they raised. Answer simply. Uh, the one trick here, though, is... Uh, separate equity capital from anything non-dilutive. Uh, I know especially a lot of our, our friends in Canada are lucky enough to have received various grants. Make sure that you separate that out a little bit. Uh, investors wanna make sure, they really do care about this. Make sure that you have enough ownership in the company 
uh, to stay incented to work really hard on this. So you don't want to, to give them the impression that you've given away everything. Investors uh, are constantly evaluating you on like these two separate dimensions, right? Like they're, they're thinking about the business itself. And to Leslie's point, they're not even evaluating what the business looks like today. In their mind, they're already visualizing five years from now. Well, enjoy, join them in that. And then the second evaluation is, what would be the math of a transaction here? What's the deal look like? And so how much capital have you raised and cap table and primary use of funds? Those start to shift the conversation from your company to the deal. Yeah. And, and to that, uh, you know, cap table is just a fancy phrase for what does the ownership of the company look like today? You may also get asked for a pro forma cap table, which is were we to do a transaction that starts looking this be later in the dating cycle, what would happen to the cap table? Uh, cap table math is harder than you think. Um, if there's anything tricky, get a rental CFO, get a lawyer, get an accountant to do this. If you, the due diligence on your cap table is inconsistent, you will lose that investor. It is the number one place where they get scared of skeletons in the closet. Um, so just make sure you really understand your math. Uh, I've seen it gone wrong a lot of times. Primary use of funds is a super simple question. Don't go asking for money if you don't know what you're going to do when you have the money. I won't do that with my 13-year-old, and I'm not going to do that with a couple million bucks. What are the primary things you need to do for your next milestone? Um, like any good product manager would, I want you to imagine where you're trying to go almost write the next pitch deck in your head for that next round and look at the gap between that story and where you are today and think in big chunks about the work, therefore the funding has to happen. You should have that at least at the lines and boxes, if I go back to product management, super epic level walking into that meeting. I'm gonna invest in a go-to-market team in this region to do this thing. Uh, how much total capital do you need to reach scale? Um, this is another dream with me question. Um, if you're talking to an investor in the Bay Area, it might be a little different. They're gonna want you to dream unboundedly large. Uh, we think we have a billion dollar opportunity. It's gonna take a lot of capital. I don't know yet. I think I could build a very profitable business in the low tens of millions. Uh, I'm excited to talk to you about what that might look like and that how big that we could get together. Uh, a lot of you are not gonna be raising money in uh, the frothy Bay Area they may want a stop in profitability. Um, so you might need to talk about like how big, big we're eventually gonna get, but that we believe will be profitable by date X. Uh, it's an important place to do a little homework on the kind of investor you're talking to before you start the conversation. All right, our last few, and then I think we've got one or two bonus round questions in the chat. Uh, if you succeed, who might buy your company? Um, this is gonna show that you should thought about the market. Uh, don't be too vague, have a few categories. Talk about the competitors that might make sense, the adjacencies that make sense. Show here that you have a, a sense of the landscape in which you're, you're operating, um, that, that you're not being completely naive here. A um, couple trick questions now. Uh, would you be willing to step down as CEO? Uh, this is a tricky question. You will probably get it in some way, shape or form. Odds are, they're gonna to try to put two beers in you and then ask you a question like this and they're get to know you session. Um, here's what we want you to say. An investor wants to know if you wanna build a big business or you wanna make everyone rich. He's not interested in the desire of power. So what you wanna say is, look man, I only wanna win. I wanna build a giant business. I think there's an incredible opportunity here. And right now, I'm the right CEO. If we get too big, if we get too complex, if it gets to a place where I am no longer the right person, I would be really excited for that problem. And I'd love to have that conversation with you because all I want to do is succeed in this market. And I'm going to do whatever it takes to do that. Um, valuation. This is another trick question. And we just beg you, do not answer it. If you think about all the scenarios, there is no right answer. You say something too, too high and you just scared them. Well, we, we, don't, we don't write checks and we don't play in that kind of uh, world. If you say it too low, you're giving it away. So this is one of the places where we're gonna recommend not giving a very straightforward answer. And you're gonna say something like, valuation is only one of the variables we're evaluating. And it's frankly, not even the most important. Uh, what we care about most is an investor who can help us see around the corner, can help us grow. So what I'm really curious about is as you look across your portfolio, who in that portfolio 
do we remind you of? Uh, only bad investors will keep pushing you on this question. They know when they ask this, they're, they're just, I guess this is the fishing talk, where they're just throwing out a line. They're just seeing if you're gonna bite. And if they wanna push you on it, that is not your investor. Um, they are looking to see if they've got a sucker at the table. And I don't want you to do business with someone who looks at you as a potential sucker. Uh, more capitals. Oh, I wanna, I wanna stop yeah, just for a moment there and just stress that even for the founders that believe themselves to be expert negotiators, if you pick a valuation, I swear to you, you're gonna be wrong. You're going to be too high or too low. The odds of you getting that number precisely right at the market clearing price, that is impossible. Please let go of that. And number two, you are sitting across virtually or in person from an expert deal maker in that investor. They will do more deals in several months than as an entrepreneur you will do in years, which means it is critical that you move any negotiation asynchronous. If you try and live negotiate, you are live negotiating with a shark and you're going to lose. <laughs> so if an investor starts to flirt with, hey, we want to make an offer to you, express your interest and your enthusiasm and your appreciation and for why this could be a great long-term relationship and say, I am so excited to see this in writing. You know I'm not alone in this decision. And I would be thrilled to then work through those details with you. By getting it in writing, you can prep for the negotiation and even the playing field a bit for what is the last major negotiation before you are going to start the relationship. Leslie, thanks for letting me interrupt there. No, it's fine. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to yes and that. That does not mean it's silence till I see a term sheet. Amy, why don't you just send me over some bullets of the rough structure you're considering? So you can have a casual conversation before you get lawyers and, and fees and all of that involved. All right, more capital. This is a positive buy sign. It means that they're interested. They wanna know how big that you can get. They wanna know whether or not you're bold. So I want you to have thought through what you would do, but also don't be foolish about just taking money. Um, the right answer is something like, look, more capital would allow us to accelerate in several important ways, including A and B and C. However, the economics of that capital would have to work for everyone. And I know that we have a lot to prove before we get to this next stage. Um, timing for closing. You're gonna get this at the end of every meeting. Um, you want to give something that creates some urgency, but not so that if your urgency elapses, they're not like, oh, it didn't work out. There's a little hair on this deal because we're all looking for information shortcuts. And one of an investor's biggest information shortcuts is what do other investors think? Um, so you say something like, look, we're running a tight process. We're taking first meetings over the next few weeks. We hope to move into business diligence next month. And, um, you know, we strongly recommend, and we see this all the time, people are kind of casually fundraising. Oh, I'm talking to a pe few people here and there. Do not do that. Do not do that. It is a process and you want to run it with timing. Take time to put together that investor list. Take time to write that first thing. Set out a cadence where you're like, these are the two weeks where I'm asking all my friends for intros. These are the two to three weeks where I'm doing first meetings so that you're moving people through the process concurrently and you can, can create some of that urgency that you need to have. Jonathan, and you want to say something? Yeah. Only with respect to urgency, please don't be the entrepreneur that says, I'm in a hurry, I'm in a rush, or Mr. VC or Miss VC, please go faster in some kind of somewhat desperate way. And the reason that's important is twofold. One is no one dates the needy person. <clears throat> No one invests in that person either. And second, you can't rush an investor that hasn't done their homework. So if you're reaching a point in the fundraise, and I would really encourage you to have some expert in your life, have an advisor, have a board member, or have someone on the leadership team that has already done this a lot, because this is a very delicate dance at a certain stage in the fundraise, you do want to create some scarcity and some momentum and force people to a close because investors will always try and take a little longer to make a decision because every day they don't invest, your business is a little bit more de-risked. You've made a little bit more progress. They've understood more about you. So you want the money as fast as possible. They want to give it to you as late as possible. And that's a tension point. So 
when you reach this tension point and you need to try and create some pressure, that's fine. There are ways of doing that, but you can't rush an investor who hasn't done their homework because if you go back to those first two rules that Leslie introduced you to earlier, is that investors only get fired for the deals they actually do. So they would rather pass on a home run than do a deal where they shorted their diligence and risk their career. And if you meet someone late that you love, that's okay. Don't cut them out. You can say something like, you know, we're deep in the process. You're a little late, but we can make it work. If you can get to a go, no go decision inside three weeks, I'm happy to put in whatever cycles and spend a lot of time with you necessary for you to get to an informed decision and accelerate into this. Um, often, it's the last investor in who winds up writing the check because they get really excited. And by the way, because by then you've gotten really good at your story. Um, so don't burn your favorite investors super early in the process because of this. Um, and, and notice my answer around three weeks, go, no, go decision. I created <sighs> scarcity without seeming desperate. I seem interested in them and I wanted to make it work. All right, finally, uh, who else are you talking to? Do not answer this. It can only be used against you, uh, particularly in a small market. If you're if you're in a region where there are only a handful of people who do things in your sector, they will collude, and they will drive down price, and they will know well if Jim's at the table, then this is what and they're going to start telling a story in their head that you don't want them to be telling. Um, their business structure, very simply, and it doesn't make them bad people. Make some good people who are doing business properly. Their business structure is to drive them to buy as much of your company for as little as possible. It's not bad, it's perfectly rational. Um, so what you can say is another judo move uh, answer. Well, I'm a consumer mobile business that's targeting Gen X. So I'm talking to the usual players in the space. But I'm curious, you've gotten to know us a little bit. What is it about our business that gets you excited and where could you add value beyond just writing a check? Um, I did that sort of classic uh, public relations uh, ABC, acknowledge, bridge, conclude. I kind of acknowledged the question they asked, I tangented over, yes, but the question I actually want to answer is this. And then I wrapped. Um, and, and that brings me to one of the questions that appeared in the chat here. Uh, do you get different questions if you're a woman? What, what if someone asks you about, you know, are you planning to have kids or whatever? You might get a couple different answers, questions. Most people are well-intentioned in them. There are a few creeps in the world, but the vast majority don't realize when they're, when they're kind of having this passive discrimination. Again, acknowledge, bridge, and conclude. They're asking you about your family. You say, you know what? I am all in on this business. I'm really excited to spend the next several years of my life doing such and such and such. And then again, you can bridge to a question that you'd like to ask them about their commitment to the business. Um, I do want so to share that for those who have questions, please join us for office hours. Like that's easy. Uh, we have a few minutes left in this presentation, so we'll tackle a couple of the one-off questions that we got, but join us for office hours. Also, additionally, if anyone wants a copy of the deck, we're happy to make it available. If you want a copy of the 28 questions, we'll even send you a template for it. Um, there's more magic in how to answer the questions and the questions themselves, but it's nice to know the test itself in advance. Um, so we really are here to help. Um, with the last few minutes, um, let's talk about the third pillar, Leslie. Yeah. Investors, okay. why don't you take this one? So um, I wish there was a faster way to do this. I wish that there was an easier way to do this, but building an investor list is still lead bullets, not silver bullets for, for those who <laughs> know the reference from the hard thing about hard things. Uh, this is the CEO's job. Um, so I understand that some co-founder relationships are truly egalitarian and you split up everything nice and uh, uh, evenly. But for investor outreach and investor relationship building, it really needs to be the CEO, particularly early stage. There's a, uh, uh, a blog post, Lines Not Dots, from Mark Suster from years ago that I've always loved. A kind of network when you don't need it. If I've met you once, it's a dot on a board. If I've met you twice, I can draw a line between the two and it's the start of a relationship. Think about some of the best relationships you know across your community, like the romantic ones. Again, they started as friends. Hey, we know each other well. Lines, not dots. So see if you can start to build up some regular rapport with investors over time. Investors are incredibly impressed when you can say, here's the status of my business. Here are the things I'm going to do next. And then six months later, you reconnect and you get to tell them, I did those things. 
lean on your network for warm introductions. Cold outreach is of limited to no value. There are great tools out there. NFX put out a pretty fantastic one uh, called Signal, where you can do some investor list building. There are beautiful and incredibly inexpensive research services that are out there do, that do a really effective job of list building for you and seeing where your common relationships are to try and build some efficiency into the process. Uh, what I want to stress, though, is minimum viable funnel. Going back a little bit, this dance that we took you through, for an institutional round, we want you to have 20 investors before you even get started trying to pitch. 20 investors for first meetings will land in a term sheet by the end, most of the time on about a four month cycle. We can answer a lot more questions about the nuance of that in office hours for those who are curious. Leslie? I'm gonna speed round some common mistakes here before we welcome Alistair back to the stage. Um, common mistakes. Every business has jargon. Uh, you don't even realize you're using it. Get rid of it. Get rid of all of it for the first meeting. Make sure that uh, you're being as casual as possible. I use the the mom test. You know, if, if you can call your mother and explain it, the initial pitch to you, then you've gotten it right. You'll get a time to impress people later. Keep it simple in the beginning. At the same time, don't be too informal. Uh, you're still asking for several million dollars. So uh, you need to figure out over time, is this a casual person, is this an easy person? Um, but until you get that, show up to that first meeting fairly buttoned up. Um, beware the too secretive. You know, we'll, we'll hear all the time, I'm not ready to share this, we're in stealth, it's too secretive. That might be okay maybe in the biosciences. Uh, generally, investors see secrets as worthless and they see it as cagey and all they care about is execution. And if they see you as somebody who's like, well, I have a great idea and that's precious, you're not the, invest the, the entrepreneur for them. Poor listening, uh, very similar to co-founder relationship. Um, everybody wants a good colleague. Everyone wants a good partner. You're not buying screws at Home Depot. You are entering a marriage that you cannot leave. Uh, so be a good colleague from the beginning. Don't set off alarm bells that you're not going to be a great person to collaborate with through hard times. Um, next, you know, and I, I was very guilty of this one. Uh, it's important, if, especially if you're technical or a product person, to realize that uh, investors don't care about your product. They don't. They want to talk about the opportunity. So focus there. And lastly, uh, we're so stuck in the weeds of today when we're running a business. Um, it's hard to zoom out but that's all the investors see. Uh, they want to know what your company could be uh, and they, they want to make sure that you can fantasize with them there. We'll, we'll wrap with just one point. We have talked about so much signaling and psychology and relationship building and how to present your materials and tell a provocative story and have all of your data room kind of locked up. And I promise, while well, all of that is important for the discipline of fundraising, the single biggest determinant of a successful fundraise is simply evidence that you are on the path of a sustainable big company. That's what investors are looking for. So if everything else we just said wasn't really prepared or wasn't really ready, but you showed up as an investor for an investor meeting and you could get you get to say, we've been growing 32% month on month for 11 consecutive months, they're going to ignore everything else and focus on that. So the more evidence you have, the easier this stuff gets. Thank you so much for joining us today. This is super playful for us. We're glad to participate. We love Startup Fest. We've been part of this community now for a few years. Uh, I never want to do it this early ever again. And next time, Alistair, <laughs> it better be in person with cocktails. Um, you can reach Leslie at leslie at enjoythework.com. My name at enjoythework.com as well and hope you join us for office hours. Alistair, you're muted. I am muted. There's no higher praise uh, than your next, our next speaker saying, I wish I'd heard this six years ago. Uh, <laughs> that tells me that we're spot on. Um, every time I hear the two of you, I kind of hate you because you're better at this stuff than me and I like talking about it. But uh, <laughs> that was absolutely beautiful. Uh, really nicely done. And uh, I think so many people in the chat just going, this is exactly what we want to hear. Uh, I appreciate you getting up this early. As you know, last year we were supposed to be running a game show in San Francisco in mid-March oh, with so you. Uh, and we literally had fun. like 
amazing startup founders and game show questions. So hopefully we can actually do that uh, in the near future and run a game show. Uh, I know I personally would love to MC a game show in the mission with you folks. Um, I think there was going to be a lot of tequila too. It was going to be good. Oh well. Uh, there was going to be a lot of tequila because Randy Smerick, who's also taken the stage at Startup Fest, is the co-owner of Fortaleza, and so uh, <laughs> always have you know a business partner who can bring Fortaleza, uh, and it's never too early for a, a tequila mimosa here. Um, <laughs> anyway, thank you both very much. Uh, I I would normally go into questions, but you're going to be sticking around for. Um, for the office hours, along with uh, folks from Georgian Partners, um, uh, who are up next. Uh, sorry, Georgian. They're no longer called Georgian Partners. Uh, Georgian, who are up next, who are Canada's biggest uh, VC fund. Most of their investments are around the U.S. We tend to think of them as like the Andreessen Horowitz of Canada. Very progressive, very focused on on uh, data and trust uh, and companies that that use data and analytics, uh, as well as the BDC, which is which I know you've worked with closely. Um, so there's some amazing office hours coming up. But before we get into office hours, there's two things I want to do. First of all, uh, I'm going to give folks a quick tour of the platform, and then I'm going to introduce what's coming up next. So uh, Jonathan Leslie, go have some coffee, and we'll see you back very soon. Uh, thank you so much, and I can't wait to hear you, the BDC, and Georgian in the breakout rooms where people will have a chance to ask you uh, more one-on-one -on -one questions. So go have some well-earned coffee, and uh, we'll see you in the breakout rooms for office hours shortly. Thank Thanks you, my friend. Time.